Multimedia Publishing Incorporated, Denver, Colorado, presents the Get Acquainted series, introducing authors and places in American literature. This unit, written by Paul Friesen, introduces Herman Melville. In this unit, you will learn who Melville was, where and when he lived, how his stories reflect his adventures as a sailor on merchant and whaling ships, and how he realized that suffering is a result of man's depravity. Herman Melville's contribution to American literature lies chiefly in two areas, his vivid accounts of exciting adventures on the high seas and his portrayal of the psychological frustrations and spiritual struggles of people in conflict with themselves, with others, and with nature. In rich symbolism, coupled with an active imagination, he told the story of man's struggle for existence against overpowering forces. Most of his stories represent his own experiences, either as a sailor or as a wanderer trying to find his place in the world. Born in New York in 1819, Melville grew up within the security and luxury of a New York mansion, the son of Alan Melville, a distinguished merchant. In New York City, young Melville enjoyed the excitement of the big city and may already have become interested in sailing as he saw the ships in the harbor. His carefree days in New York were suddenly ended at the age of 11 when his father was forced to declare bankruptcy. The family moved to Albany, where his father tried unsuccessfully to recover from financial ruin. Two years later, Alan Melville died, leaving the family almost penniless. Herman Melville, only 13 years old, felt keenly the tragedy of his father's death and the family's poverty. Through his brother's business efforts, Melville was able to attend Albany Academy, but he dropped out after two years. He had no occupation or promise of steady employment. He worked in his uncle's bank for a time, helped clerk in his brother's store, and worked on a farm. He tried teaching school, but resigned after one term. Finally, with some reluctance, he bade farewell to his mother and his seven brothers and sisters and headed for New York City and the sea. He signed on as a cabin boy on a merchant ship bound for Liverpool, England. The voyage lasted four months, but it marked the beginning of his first-hand experiences on board ocean-going vessels. Following this voyage, he again taught school, but without enthusiasm or determination to establish himself permanently in an occupation. The next year, in 1841, as a 22-year-old adventurous and optimistic youth, he sailed from New Bedford on the whaling ship Akushnet, bound for the South Seas. His life as a sailor lasted only four years, but the wealth of adventure and experience gained during this time provided ample material for six books written between 1846 and 1851, filled with exciting accounts of the rigorous life aboard 19th century whalers and frigates. After he returned from this voyage, he settled down briefly in the home of his mother, now living in Lansingburg, New York. He fascinated his family with accounts of his adventures, telling them so realistically and in such detail that they urged him to write the accounts among the admiring listeners was his sister's friend, Elizabeth Shaw, the daughter of Chief Justice Lemuel Shaw of Boston. Two years later, in 1847, Melville and Elizabeth Shaw were married. At the time of their marriage, Melville had already published two novels, Taipei and Omu. In the next three years, he published Marty, Redburn, and White Jacket. The first two books sold well, but the next three contained too much satire, social reform, and philosophical discussion to satisfy a romantic reading public. The first book, Taipei, depicts in fictitious manner Melville's first adventures on a whaling ship. Published in 1846, it gained almost instant recognition and became popular in England as well as in America 
for its exciting tales of a white man who had lived among cannibals. In Taipei, Melville recounted his adventures among the natives in the Valley of the Taipees in the Marquesas Islands of the South Pacific. After 18 months on board the Yakushnet, Melville and a companion deserted the ship while it was anchored off the island of New Cahiva. Whether Melville deserted because he detested the hunger, cruelty, and near mutiny on this ship, or whether he was eager for another kind of adventure is not known. Melville and his friend Toby escaped from the rest of the crew while on shore leave for a day. After almost insurmountable difficulties, they finally reached the opposite side of the island where they met a young girl and boy who escorted them to their village. The natives proved to be quite friendly despite their reputation as cannibals. During the time Melville was here, he enjoyed the feasts and rituals of the people and he especially enjoyed the attentions of the young native girl, Fayaway. Melville and his friend Toby soon won the confidence of the chief, a warrior decorated with tattoos and ornaments. Through his friendship, they felt reasonably secure. As they became acquainted with the natives, they realized that warlike and cannibalistic tendencies were prompted by aggressive acts of cruelty perpetrated by civilized white men landing on their shores and disrupting their peaceful existence. Melville was rescued by sailors from another whaling vessel, but was put ashore on the island of Tahiti with several other crewmen accused of being mutineers. These adventures constitute the story in his second novel, Omu, published in 1847. With two novels eagerly read by an appreciative reading public, Melville was rapidly realizing his ambition of becoming a noted writer. But he was becoming increasingly aware of and disturbed with the evil forces at work in man and in nature. The apparently idyllic life of the Pacific Island natives was not the utopia of his optimistic dreams. Growing more pessimistic and disillusioned at this time, he saw man as an alienated wanderer, searching for identity and purpose, but controlled by external deterministic forces. His next two novels, Marty and Redburn, express his pessimism. In Marty, he satirically and realistically portrayed the bitter experiences of his journeys in the South Pacific. In Redburn, he recalled his first voyage to Liverpool aboard the merchant ship. He emphasized the inhumane treatment of sailors, both in disciplinary measures and in an epidemic of cholera on the ship. Disappointed over the public rejection of his last two novels, he attempted another book called White Jacket, based on his life in the Navy on board the frigate the United States, which took him from Hawaii to Boston, where he was discharged from the Navy. White Jacket failed to restore his popularity. Disappointed and in financial difficulty, he bought this farm, which he named Arrowhead, near Pittsfield, Massachusetts. He sought to establish himself as a gentleman farmer, raising a few crops and continuing his riding career. On one occasion, he happened to meet Nathaniel Hawthorne, who was living nearby at this time and developed a close and lasting friendship with him. After many lengthy conversations with him about a story plot, Melville wrote his turbulent, exhaustive, and authoritative masterpiece, Moby Dick. He dedicated it to Hawthorne. Melville labored two years in a final ambitious effort to regain his popularity by returning to the adventurous style which had made his first two novels successful. In Moby Dick, he portrayed the rigorous, dangerous, exciting, but often futile efforts to conquer the mighty whale. In addition, he added the larger dimension of man's efforts to overcome overwhelming odds. Melville told the complete story of a whaling voyage from the signing on of sailors to the culmination of the voyage, in this case, the destruction of the ship. Sailors awaiting departure usually stayed in special lodgings, such as the mariner's home called the Spouter Inn in Moby Dick. Here, Ishmael, the narrator of this story, spent several nights before leaving on the long journey. Whaling was a hazardous profession. Voyages were three to four years long, and many lives were lost through disease, accidents, and shipwrecks. 
Before leaving the safety of the shore, sailors committed themselves to God's care in seashore chapels, such as this one in New Bedford. In Moby Dick, Melville wrote, In the same New Bedford there stands a whaleman's chapel, and few are the moody fishermen shortly bound for the Indian or Pacific Oceans who fail to make a Sunday visit to this spot. The chapel was open to all who were inclined to come. Ishmael, the narrator, visited here on the Sunday before his departure and was surprised to see the pagan idol worshiper, Queequeg, with whom he had shared a room and bed in the Spouter Inn, seated in a rear pew. As Ishmael entered the chapel, he noticed a small scattered congregation of sailors and sailors' wives and widows. Each silent worshiper seemed purposely sitting apart from the other, as if each silent grief were insular and incommunicable. Ishmael noticed that some of the worshipers were gazing at marble tablets mounted on the walls. Each tablet was inscribed with the name of a father, or a husband, or a brother who had lost his life at sea. Melville himself had visited this chapel and was especially intrigued with the design of the pulpit. In Moby Dick, he recorded, nor was the pulpit itself without a trace of sea taste. Its paneled front was in the likeness of a ship's bluff bows, and the Holy Bible rested on a projecting piece of scroll work fashioned after a ship's fiddle-headed beak. From the pulpit in the novel, Ishmael heard Father Mappel, the chaplain, preach a sermon based on the story of Jonah and the whale, admonishing the sailors to resist temptations and to obey the word of God. The story of Jonah was familiar to Melville, who knew the Bible well, alluding frequently in his works to its accounts of sea voyages and references to whales. Although Ishmael seated himself in a rear pew of the main sanctuary, sailors generally assembled for their own special services in the lower meeting room, known as the salt box. The chapel stands today as a monument to the rich history of the whaling industry, and to the faith of those who waited anxiously for the safe return of loved ones. They often watched from the tower or observatory for the arrival of ships far out in the bay. Melville described in detail the arrangements for the departure and the beginning stages of the voyage of the Pequod and its crew in Moby Dick. After the crew was selected and all provisions were on board, the sailors gave a last look at the shore with its safety, comfort, and friends then the ship weighed anchor and blindly plunged like fate into the lone Atlantic. Melville knew by experience the possible fate awaiting the crew of a whaling vessel. Whaling was a dangerous business, concentrating usually on the most valuable whale, the sperm whale. Using its head as a battering ram, the sperm whale could sink a ship. With a slap of its tail, it could smash a whaling boat. In Moby Dick, the crew of the Pequod soon learned that their captain, the monomaniac Ahab, was obsessed with revenge on a great white sperm whale named Moby Dick. On a previous voyage, Ahab had fought vainly to capture the whale, only to have his leg bitten off by the monster. In a chapter entitled Measurement of the Whale Skeleton, Melville described the enormous size of the sperm whale. Its length, fully grown, was about 100 feet, its depth, or diameter, about 16 feet. Against the double odds of size and the nature of the battleground, the sailors fearlessly pursued and captured many whales on each voyage. Whales were sighted by lookouts, keeping watch from the mastheads a hundred feet above the deck. When a whale was sighted, the lookouts cried out, There she blows! Immediately, the captain's command to lower away produced a scurry of activity as the boats dropped into the ocean and the chase began. In silent pursuit, the whale boat crew approached the unsuspecting whale. Each man had his assignment, and each knew that one careless move or error in judgment could mean death. In grand style, Melville described the chase and the harpooning of the whale. After rowing hard, the harpooner oarsman must be ready at the command, stand up and give it to him, to drop and secure his oar, turn around, 
seize his harpoon from the crotch, and with what little strength may remain, pitch it somehow into the whale. If the harpooner is successful, which Melville said was only five times out of 50, the whalemen have to get set for a wild ride known as a Nantucket sleigh ride as the whale races through the water in fear and rage. As the whale weakens, the boat crew pull in the line and begin the real battle. In the novel, Melville described in vivid detail the three days of the chase in the battle with the great white whale, Moby Dick. Captain Ahab, in his eagerness to attack Moby Dick, joined the crew of the first pursuing boat. As he peered into the sea, he saw the whale coming toward him, its vast shadowed bulk still half blending with the blue of the sea. The glittering mouth yawned beneath the boat. Giving one sidelong sweep with his steering oar, Ahab whirled the craft aside. Moby Dick, with that malicious intelligence ascribed to him, transplanted himself, shooting his pleated head lengthwise beneath the boat. Through every plank and each rib, it thrilled for an instant. The whale, lying on his back, slowly and feelingly taking its bows full within its mouth so that the long, narrow, scrolled lower jaw curled high up into the open air. Then it was that monomaniac Ahab, furious with this tantalizing vicinity of his foe, which placed him all alive and helpless in the very jaws he hated, seized the long bone with his naked hands. As now he thus vainly strove, the jaw slipped from him, the frail gunnels bent in, collapsed and snapped, as both jaws, like an enormous shears, bit the craft completely in twain and locked themselves fast again in the sea, midway between the two floating wrecks. On the third day of the chase, Moby Dick destroyed the ship and all hands aboard, except Ishmael, who lived to tell the story. As the ship sank, it created a whirlpool. Small fowls flew screaming over the yawning gulf. A sullen white surf beat against its steep sides. Then all collapsed, and the great shroud of the sea rolled on as it rolled 5,000 years ago. Melville's reputation had been severely diminished by the three novels preceding Moby Dick. Consequently, little attention was given to this novel with its symbolism, its moralizing, and its tragic ending. He wrote the novel Pierre and several other novels and stories in the next six years. After a trip to Europe and the Holy Land, he joined the lecture circuit for three seasons but enjoyed little success. Finally, in 1866, at the age of 47, he was appointed as the Deputy Inspector of Customs for the Seaport in New York City. For 19 years, he enjoyed the steady income of his government physician. During this time, he wrote a few stories and published three volumes of poetry, Claro, Battle Pieces, and Timoleon. He was in the process of preparing another volume of poetry, entitled John Marr, when illness stopped his effort. Following his retirement, he wrote his final novel, Billy Budd, based on an incident involving Melville's cousin, who had presided at a court-martial trial at which a sailor was condemned to hang. Melville displayed in Billy Budd the tragedy and injustice of false accusations and suspicions of superiors on board a British warship. In the novel, the young sailor, Billy Budd, witnesses with horror the flogging of a fellow sailor. Billy determines to obey all rules and commands in order to avoid punishment. Unfortunately, the jealous master-at-arms, John Clackert, falsely accuses Billy of planning a mutiny. In Captain Veer's office, the charges are spelled out. In speechless disbelief, Billy suddenly strikes Claggart on the forehead with his fist. It's a fatal blow. Billy is tried for murder and hanged from the yard arm early the next morning. Just before he dies, he utters his only words, God bless Captain Veer. In Billy Budd, Melville recognized that external fate and determinism exert less control over suffering and misfortunes than does the basic depravity of man himself. For Melville, the realization that man is responsible for his own condition and ultimate destiny offered a measure of consolation and reconciliation within himself and his view of mankind. 
Melville died in obscurity in 1891 at the age of 72. He was buried in the Manan Cemetery near Albany, New York. Today, the Whaling Museum in New Bedford, Massachusetts, perpetuates the memory of this important whaling port and Melville's contributions to the industry and adventure of whaling. Melville's reputation has spread to many parts of the world, chiefly through his masterpiece, Moby Dick, which endures as a portrait of universal suffering and determination. His fame, coming too late for him to enjoy, is preserved in his stories and poems and in the chapel and whaling museum in New Bedford. <laughs>